this is where we left off, I think. I, I had taken you through uh, Patanjali and the eight-limbed path, the Ashtanga, the eight-limbed path of Patanjali, um, which really was the defining, um, the defining, defining contribution of the classical period of yoga. Well, after Patanjali, um, a number of yogis uh, arose who strove to create a system uh, drawing upon uh, the work, the understanding, the, the technology that uh, Patanjali uh, helped to create and organize. Uh, they, they took this and uh, were uh, really interested on, in rejuvenating the body and prolonging life. Um, and so uh, they believed that the body itself uh, was the means by which you can achieve enlightenment. So there's this notion on this eight-limbed path. You start with the yamas and the niyamas, uh, and you move into the asana, the, the physical postures, and the pranayama. And as you dedicate yourself to this, this very physical practice, the the um, the enlightenment, the transcendental aspect, the meditative or psychic aspects of uh, the yoga will unfold themselves to you. So the, the body as a very corporeal uh, pathway to um, to higher understanding or enlightenment, and. Um, from this, they developed what's called tantric yoga. So uh, tantric yoga has um, some pretty uh, radical techniques to cleanse the body and the mind uh, and to break these so-called knots that uh, would bind us to our physical existence. So if you uh, really get into uh, the discipline of tantric yoga, there's all, all kinds of uh, various methods that they'll use to clean the body. Perhaps you've seen them taking uh, the linen cloth and they will swallow that linen cloth and they'll pass this cloth that's, you know, many meters long through their entire body slowly uh, as a method of, of cleaning themselves. Um, so that, that's one of, of many different um, techniques in, in tantric yoga, but that's they say radical. Um, and all of this led to the creation of what we now call Hatha Yoga. So most yoga that uh, we practice is some sort of, is based on a, ya, a Hatha, uh, Hatha Asana, Hatha forms. Uh, the word, we'll talk about Hatha more later, but Hatha, the word itself, uh, is is a combination of uh, light and dark, or sun and moon, and is meant to be the breath that comes uh, in through one nostril and exhaled through the another uh, the other nostril. Um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, but I don't want to go into it too much depth for the moment. Um, so, from this post-classical period, we're going to bring it into more uh, modern eras, the more modern era. And I realize that this doesn't look modern, uh, but we are talking about uh, a discipline here that has been going on for 10,000 years. So the fact that any of this is in photographs uh, means that it's actually quite modern. Um, and the first thing that uh, I think we can can point to uh, to be a, a, a real uh, watershed moment was uh, this guy Swami Vivekananda. Uh, Vivekananda visited uh, this conference that was held in Chicago in 1893 and it was the so-called Parliament of Religions. That's what they, uh, they dubbed it. And they had representatives of uh, all of the major uh, the, the great religious sects uh, throughout the world. And they all talked about the sort of universality um, of uh, certain aspects of all religions. Right? 
And I think that's pretty obvious to most people nowadays how uh, there, are, there are some fundamental aspects of uh, the faith uh, in, in the world that tie them all together. And this is what this meeting was about. Well, this guy get up, got up there and, um, and was uh, very eloquent, apparently, in his articulation of this universality of uh, the world's uh, spiritual disciplines. Um, and it was during this that uh, yoga and the yogic practice uh, began to be more widely recognized out of a very uh, small region in India. So uh, this guy um, sort of saw the potential of this and dedicated his life to uh, spreading uh, the teachings of uh, yoga outside of the narrow realm in which it had lived for millennia. Um, and in 36, he founded this thing called the Divine Life Society, uh, still in India, still in India. This was on the banks of the, the Holy Ganges River. So this guy, uh, he came to America and understood the universality of it, but he was still really rooted in India and, uh, the, and the, that cultural tradition. Uh, so this Divine Life Society was meant to be a sort of um, a, a, a center, a global center for learning and study. Uh, he was a very prolific author, wrote uh, over 200 books, um, and then established uh, nine ashrams. Uh, an ashram would be like a, a spiritual center uh, where they would uh, devote themselves uh, to this discipline and a lot of other yoga centers around the world. But this Divine Life Society was sort of like the head of his, uh, at this point now, global network of uh, ashrams and, and uh, yoga centers. This is just an example of his, uh, I guess that was their, their symbol. Serve, love, meditate, realize. Swami Vivekananda. Um, another person uh, that was extremely important uh, was this guy, uh, Krishnamacharya, T. Krishnamacharya. And um, he opened up the first uh, school dedicated to Hatha yoga um, in Mysore, India. And this happened in 1924. Um, and Krishnamacharya was, uh, by all accounts, a extremely remarkable individual. Uh, his yogic practice was at an extremely high level. And uh, beyond that, he emanated um, a, a sense of, of peace and, and grounding um, that sort of radiated out from him. This, this extremely influential person. So this was in Mysore, India. Um, this is Mysore Palace. He was not in the palace. That's just what Mysore is famous for. Uh, but, um, for example, the, the yoga that I practiced with you called the Ashtanga Yoga, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, that is practiced in the so-called Mysore style. Uh, the Mysore style is uh, a type of uh, Ashtanga where you would go uh, to this center that Krishnamacharya uh, had founded and you would practice the yoga at your own pace, in your own practice. And there's this idea that everybody's yoga practice is their own. Um, and the yogi that is helping you, your guru, would add poses uh, to you as you went along. And yeah. Was that the first time that yoga was thought of as that practice? Nope, I don't, nope. nope. But, uh, I'm just, I'm pointing out the Mysore style because uh, in the West, yoga is predominantly thought of as a class that you go to with a teacher and everybody's all synced up, their breath is all synced up and everybody's moving at the same pace. And if a student 
uh, is moving slower than somebody else or lags or something, uh, then oftentimes there's this sort of silent, you know, oh no, trying to like rush and keep up with the class or something like that. And that is, that's contrary to um, the way yoga was originally practiced. And so the, the Mysore style, when you, when you hear that, that explicitly means that uh, it's, a, it's a type of class, I guess, uh, where you would go, but you, there's not global instruction. There's individual instruction, and you're practicing there in the presence of a, of a guru. So Krishnamacharya. And uh, this guy, Krishnamacharya, uh, his school, there's some pictures. I should, I should have put a picture up of what the school actually looked like. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, these little children, he had, he had young children that would go and dedicate themselves uh, to this practice. It's super flexible, little kids. Um, these were the four most famous of his students. He had many students. Krishnamachari had a lot of students. But these four had the, the largest, I would say, impact on uh, what was to be modern yoga. So uh, the first is this guy, Patabi Joyce. Uh, Patabi Joyce is the student um, who founded uh, what we call Ashtanga Yoga. So Ashtanga, before Patabi Joyce, was known to be the eight-limbed path, right? And he took that word and said, this, this is Ashtanga Yoga, and he, he put... Um, a series of asana that um, that is sequential and cumulative. So there are uh, beginning, intermediate, and more advanced series, uh, each of which is meant to take uh, something like seven years to master. So it would take you 30 or 40 years, uh, supposedly, to, to master the body of asana that it is within uh, uh, of, of this group, uh, Patabi Joyce was probably the most uh, athletic and sort of vigorous of, of these yogis. Um, the next guy, uh, uh, TKV Desikashar, uh, was actually Krishnamacharya's son. And uh, amongst this group, um, he was probably the most philosophical. So he certainly dedicated his idea uh, to um, his life to the life of ideas. Um, he wrote very elo eloquently, apparently was a man of great kindness and compassion and uh, very humble, a lot of humility in, in him. Uh, the next character here is BKS Iyengar. Have, have any of you heard of Iyengar before? There is a, a type of yoga named after him, Iyengar. Um, and he, the, the focus of Iyengar's yoga, he uh, was apparently a feeble uh, child. There was something, um, that he wasn't especially healthy for some reason. Uh, he wasn't very robust. And uh, so he focused on healing the body through yoga, so uh, remediating injury and, and illness and weakness through yoga. And he also had a, an exquisite uh, attention to alignment. So his forms, he, they, uh, Iyengar yoga uses a lot of like blocks and straps and, and whatever. Uh, they focus a lot on, on alignment. You will be having uh, a really amazing person named Amy Bird, uh, who is an Iyengar uh, yogi. Who, or yogini, who will come in and, uh, and share a practice with you later in the semester. She's pretty cool. But she does Iyengar, so you'll get to see what that's like. Um, and then the fourth person is Indra Devi. And what's interesting about Indra Devi is these, these three people were uh, Indian, or of Indian origin, and they were male. Uh, she was a, a Caucasian woman, um, uh, from the United States, who changed her name and, and became a devotee of Krishnamacharya. And what is um, her, her, I would say, contribution was not so much 
in terms of yogic formalism, the way these guys uh, did, but she uh, did a lot to popularize yoga. And we'll see, uh, I'll go into that a little bit more in a bit. So Indra Devi is a pretty fascinating character. They, they all are, all four of them are. Um, Patavi Joyce just, and actually Iyengar and Patavi Joyce both just recently died, uh, super old men. But Patavi Joyce died, I think, in, uh, when was that? It was while I was training, so it must have been like 2009, something like that. All right. Um, and, and so then there's America, right? So up, up to this point, all these guys that I was showing and I was showing you, they were uh, Indian, except for Indra Devi, and we'll get to her. Uh, the, they were Indian uh, yogis that practiced in India, but were trying to reach out globally. Um, and it came to America, and the cultural exchange was, I would say, imperfect. At, at, you know, in the beginning. And um, so there, there, this next little section I probably could omit, but I'm going to go through it because it's kind of interesting. Um, it, it just sort of looks at, sort of fits and starts the like incomplete, imperfect way that America um, was able to adopt the uh, adopt yoga. So this is a picture. I think uh, Annie's talked about this. Has she uh, shown you this picture? Uh, the Denishon School in Los Angeles. Uh, this woman named Ruth St. Dennis. Uh, she's an American dancer, and she had done this some sort of correspondence course. She had gotten some books through the mail, and um, and had assimilated them and fashioned herself to be a, a yoga instructor. And she sort of blended it with her uh, understanding of dance. And so this is an example of a, a yoga class that she was uh, leading in, in uh, L.A. back in 100 years ago. Right. Here are some, some other people. And I, as I go through this, some of these people were more uh, perhaps sincere than others. There's this, so there's this... Um, continuum, a sort of a spectrum of people that uh, were, were sincerely seeking and others who had all kinds of agendas. Uh, but, but the idea here is that yoga itself is, um, there, it is, it, it has a distinct cultural origin and that is something to be aware of uh, for sure as we explore this and, and looking at the early ways in which People either succeeded or failed at grasping that, I think, is instructive. So here's this guy, William Walker Atkinson. Um, pretty interesting guy. Uh, he was, uh, he's from Baltimore, and he was a lawyer um, and was an author in this sort of school of new thought, authors and, uh, who were in the school of new thought that were trying to break out of uh more conventional uh, Eurocentric uh, philosophy. Um, and uh, he did so by writing under this name Yogi Ramasharaka. Ramasharaka. Yogi Ramasharaka, that's what he called himself. Uh, obviously, not his name. But uh, he wrote uh, these books, and so here's an example a super advanced course of yoga. Super advanced. Uh, and, uh, oh, this is, this, no, I'm sorry, this was not his. This was a correspondence course from the 19th century, uh, this one by a guy named uh, Rishi Singh Durwal. We'll talk about him. But this would have been the kind of uh, thing that Ruth St. Dennis would have, um, would have uh, gotten through the mail when she was trying to develop her own yoga thing. Um, yeah, in, in uh, 1903, this guy um, began to write under the name Yogi Rama Sharaka, and uh, he was actually, he, he was the first to release a vinyl record in the United uh, States. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm conflating three people. I am learning this along with you. It's kind of interesting. But uh, the first guy to do that was this guy named Wasan Singh, or Yogi Wasan. Um, 
and he put a vinyl record together that had these uh, healing chants on them. So uh, there began to be, uh, the point of all this, there began to be a little bit of a commercialization. These people started trying to make a living uh, by producing stuff that they could sell. Uh, they were sort of marketing yoga. Um, yeah, there's a story about Wasan Singh that I read that I'm, I'm not remembering here. Okay, so this is the guy, uh, Singh, Rishi Singh Garwal, uh, who had that correspondence course. Uh, this guy, <clears throat> so he uh, was a um, Indian American who was uh, came to the United, who was in the United States and started trying to uh, teach asana, so or posture based yoga. Um, and he had emigrated, but the Supreme Court uh, in 1923 ruled that South Asians were ineligible for citizenship. Obviously, uh, a, a, a racist uh, decision by the Supreme Court, not their finest hour. Uh, but this guy was a bit of a fighter uh, for, for the idea of uh, democracy. And he moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, to help lobby various senators to oppose uh, this uh, idea um, held by the Supreme Court. And uh, while he would, he would lobby these people, by day, and then at night, he would have these yoga classes in some hotel where he was, uh, he was staying. Uh, he eventually uh, won and was able to secure citizenship, uh, ultimately. Uh, he moved, after that, he moved to Santa Barbara, California, where he uh, established a place called White Lotus Yoga Center, which I, I believe still exists there. So uh, this guy actually was a, a bit of an interesting uh, character who had uh, um, a, a distinct impact. This guy, Sant Ram Mandal, uh, was um, a, another uh, Indian American who was from California. He lived in uh, Oakland. And he got a master's degree in mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley. He went to Berkeley and uh, graduated with a master's degree in 1922. But uh, that, that's pretty significant in and of itself. Uh, however, he decided to duck out of the sciences. And uh, he began to teach mystic psychology, uh, changing his name to Yogi Santorama. Um, and this took uh, various yogic asana, the postures uh, that we, we've all been doing, but he blended it with a kind of spiritualism, a mystical spiritualism uh, that was beginning to uh, grow in the United States where they, they didn't fully understand uh, the... Uh, ideas behind yoga, and so they associated it with these uh, sort of mystical powers, and he kind of capitalized on that. So they would do asana, but they would have uh, spiritual seances, psychic readings. He uh, would do astrological forecasts, crystal ball stuff. Um, uh, he wrote several books. There's one of them called The Happy Flute. I have a picture of leopard skin underwear there uh, to remind me that um, he actually appeared in the New York Times once doing uh, yoga poses wearing some leopard skin uh, underwear, which is funny. <laughs> about it. It's just kind of, kind of made me laugh a little. Um, so what, what else was I going to say about him? I, uh, is this the guy? Yeah. So here's a picture of him. Uh, leading, here he is, he's leading this uh, crowd of devotees, and you can see that he's kind of shrouded himself in this, uh, this aura of mystery and mystique and mystical, 
the trappings of it, uh, which certainly someone like Krishnamacharya uh, would would have no use for. But um, he was, I think this is the guy, he uh, got famous because apparently he had uh, really strong breath control and he was, he was quite fit. He was a pretty strong guy. And he actually saved, uh, I should save this story, but I think it's him. Uh, he saved two people from drowning uh, and became famous uh, for his, his physical prowess. Uh, oh, no, that's this guy, the Wasan Singh. That's Wasan Singh. Should have trusted my, my slides. So, yeah, Wasan Singh uh, is another guy. So we're sort of moving up the, the West Coast. Uh, he was based in Oregon and Washington in the 20s through 30s uh, and had a, a, a pretty robust business selling these uh, books. The Raja Yoga book on the all-seeing eye spiritual mas magic and the cosmic ray, occult science, mastermind, master healing by Guru Yogi Vasan. So you can see that I, certainly this was based on uh, this guy was doing some asana. Uh, there was there was an integration of general uh, genuine yogic principles, but it was also kind of getting conflated with um, a, a lot of sort of mysticism. Uh, and and all of this all of this sort of opportunism began to kind of erode at the general population's uh, understanding or, or willingness to accept uh, yoga. So here is an actual uh, newspaper clipping from the Washington Post, that paragon of open-minded liberalism, um, in, uh, dated February 12, 1912, a little over 100 years ago. And it said, I'm, I'm uh, expanding the... the uh, byline there, unprecedented activity in proselytizing by swamis throughout the United States has caused this government to investigate migration of converts to India. Women are forsaking fortunes, homes, husband, and their children in their search for the perfect way. And uh, sadly, they identify um, uh, this guy uh, here who was uh, Abhidananda, uh, who was a student of Vivekananda um, as being one of the people who was convincing, you know, th they targeted him. Uh, he was certainly a genuine uh, yogi who just wanted to spread the actual understanding of, of the discipline and not one of these, like, kind of marginal charlatan-type characters that... Uh, just trying to make money. But um, anyways, uh, Vivekananda had sent his sort of emissaries around the world. Um, and one of them was this guy, Adhidananda, uh, who went uh, uh, to the West, and he headed up this thing called the uh, Vedanta Society in New York. Um, and this was five years after the, uh, the, the parliament of... Uh, religions that Vivekananda uh, spoke at. So in this, this place, this Vedanta Society in New York became one of the major centers for uh, yoga and yogic thought in, on the East Coast. So a lot of what I've been talking about was on the West Coast. All right. Um, here was uh, another person, uh, an African-American woman known as Miss La Birdla Ship. Um, and uh, she uh, was from San Bernardino, California. And in 1906, so very early on, this person was uh, very early picking up on uh, Vivekananda and a lot of uh, the, um, the sort of the brew of mysticism and yoga that was, was coming over. And she styled herself the, quote, Hindu mystic princess Ganesha Yogini of India. Um, she would uh, adorn herself with flowing robes of silk and lace and uh, 
these are just quotes describing it, uh, an embroidered circlet of jewels around her head. Uh, she claimed uh, incorrectly that she was from Malawa, India, and presided over this temple that she uh, founded called the Mystic Temple of Unity and School of Yoga Philosophy. Uh, really, this was uh, a front for her to, um, to do fortune telling. Uh, it was a fortune telling operation. Uh, but she gave different topics there, such as the law of karma and the science of breath. Um, it, it only lasted for a brief time, uh, but um, I, I bring her up because it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, thing. First of all, that an African-American woman in 1906 had uh, the wherewithal to, to, to do this thing. It's pretty remarkable. That's it's interesting in and of itself, but it it, I just said how confused the boundaries of race, legitimacy, and legality were uh, in yoga in the early years in America. So, something to consider. Uh, colorful, interesting uh, stories of, of the history. So then that brings us to Indra Devi, um, who is, is also, I, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to think about uh, this person and what um, what this what this means? Um, she was the first uh, really famous uh, Caucasian white uh, person to be an, uh, an advocate of yoga, and certainly she was pedigreed. She came uh, from the tutelage of uh, Krishna Macharya, as I had said earlier. Earlier, her uh, her name, her birth name was Eugenie V. Peterson. And um, she went to study with Krishnamacharya in his later years. And after uh, a, that period uh, of time, she came back to the United States and opened a yoga studio uh, in Hollywood in 1947. That was like pretty perfect time to open up a yoga studio in Hollywood. So here's an example of a uh, record that uh, she put out. And she started putting out books, but records, a lot of, a lot of vinyl records that uh, people could buy, put on their turntable, and listen to and learn about uh, yoga or whatever. An authentic course for home practice by Indra Devi. And absolutely, uh, <clears throat> she did disseminate uh, genuine yoga asana to the population and, and more or less free from all the sort of uh, mystical uh, stuff, the mystical mumbo jumbo uh, that had been plaguing a lot of the early attempts to incorporate yoga into the United States. Um, and she was in Hollywood, so she got the movie stars, and the movie stars uh, loved it. Uh, so I am quite certain that um, you guys don't know all of these movie stars, but your grandparents certainly would have uh, a, a very good familiarity with uh, these people. Gloria Swanson, very famous. Greta Garbo, uh, Ava Gabor uh, were all students of Indra uh, Devi's. I'm sure you've all heard of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and so these pictures of movie stars starting to do yoga uh, in the late 40s and 50s, uh, began to spread out into the mainstream, right? And so uh, women at home who thought Gloria Swanson was the bee's knees, they go out and they get an Indra Devi record, and it began, uh, it began to filter out into the world a little bit. Marilyn Monroe was, was certainly probably the, the biggest... Uh, banner uh, advocate for it, uh, the most famous of them. So uh, here's a 1948 uh, calendar with uh, Marilyn Monroe doing yoga, a different yoga pose for each month. That's a different kind of calendar. Um, and here's some, uh, here's some uh, magazine of some sort that talks about uh, Hollywood's yogi, Indra Devi, etc. Um, here's another uh, article from Pageant Magazine. I don't know anything about Pageant, pageant Magazine, but in 1952, uh, Marilyn Monroe herself penned 
this long article uh, that you see, see there called How I Stay in Shape. And she gave uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, account of how she stayed in shape uh, with the various asana, the yoga routines, uh, and the Ayurvedic diet that she used, the sort of Indian uh, food science, health science-based diet that she uh, consumed. So um, that did a lot to sort of legitimize uh, yoga in the mass mind and dispel these uh, ideas that it was um, sort of a, like an occult science or a, sort of like a, an occult um, theft or something like that. So then came the 60s and the Beatles and LSD. Um, <laughs> and uh, at that point, um, so you know, a lot of what I'm talking about here is just how um, celebrity was uh, aligned and used to disseminate yoga. Uh, you, you have this guy, the Maharishi uh, Mahesh Yogi, who, uh, you know, uh, was sought out by the Beatles in India, and they did some meditation. The guy uh, clearly was um, some sort of um, learned man. Uh, other people, so for example, Donovan, uh, whose son went to Colby, graduated not too long ago. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, it became, these guys popularized it, and um, even further into the 60s. And these people, like this guy, I don't, Richard Hillman is, is clearly a nobody, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like, a lot of people got in on the act as well, right? And so he, he's trying to make a couple bucks uh, sending yoga uh, records out into the world uh, for people to do in, in the uh, calm of their own house. He would be stoked to be on the same slide as the Beatles and Donovan, though, I'm sure. So, and, and the 60s, you know, uh, really a lot of uh, the purported ideals uh, of the 60s uh, were in line with um, the, the, uh, the seeking aspect, you know, the seeking enlightenment uh, that is common to yoga, all forms of yoga. So it, it became really popular in the 60s, right? And so you had these, uh, you know, yogic um, groups popping up all over the country, all over the place. Um, I am, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to go and, and drag us all the way up through the yoga journal or something like that uh, into the modern times because I think you guys are probably more familiar with uh, how yoga has uh, evolved and uh, come to us. It is, it is certainly a mainstream uh, activity now that is much more understood than it was in the earliest of introduction here in the United States. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears. Did you guys have any questions about that? If I can answer them, I will. That was, that was a, a lot of history. Yoga. Let's let's get it to science. This is a science class. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to know what you think science is. What do you think science is? So there are 12 of you. Why don't we have uh, groups of four of you break up. So you go that way, you four there, and you four here. Uh, just get into a little circle and spend a couple minutes and try to figure out what you think science is. What does it mean? What is science? Like, how is it done? Or what does it mean to be science? What's different between science and a religion? Uh, that, that sort of thing. Just what's your experience of science? How do you know that something is actually scientific? What is science? By the way, that's Marie Curie. Yes. What else? Anything else? What about you guys? What's the best of what you guys have? Tell me. Just say it. Let's get a real definition. Miriam Webster. Um, the intellectual, practical activities of the human being 
That is incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. That A, A plus. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing that you that you have that. Um, yeah, it's incredible. You just pulled that out of your head. Uh, okay. So, all right. I realize these are some slides that you uh, have not seen. They, there's some, there's some slides you haven't seen. Um, but uh, science is a process. It is a process. It's a, it's a method uh, by which we go about understanding uh, the answer to a question. It's, it's, a, it's a method by which we seek uh, an understanding uh, to a question. So this method was really first uh, described by uh, Ibn al-Hatam in the 10th century, uh, an Arabic a Muslim scholar. And um, he came up with this flow. So ask a question. What is a question? Why is the sky blue? Uh, ask a question and find out what people know about the question. Do some background research. What do other people know? Given this background understanding, form a hypothesis. And a hypothesis, does anybody want to venture a, a definition? Yeah, Nikki, give me. Um, it's like kind of an idea of what you think the outcome Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a, a model. You, you form some sort of a model of, of what you think is going on, and, and it gives a prediction as to what you think the outcome of, a, of an experiment will be, right? So we're going to then test the hypothesis with an experiment. You make observations. You guys pointed out observations. You analyze, analyze. So this is um, analyze the results. An analysis is something that uh, can be quantitative or qualitative, but usually quantitative. Uh, and then you're going to form a conclusion. And then you go in a circle. So this conclusion. My conclusion is whatever. You know, why, why are all of the ash trees dying? Well, it looks like there's a bunch of these green bugs that are here that didn't used to be here. And uh, maybe the green bugs are eating the trees. And, uh, well, I'm going to take a bunch of dead trees and see if the green bugs are in there and see if they're, uh, you know, whatever. You come up with an experiment, uh, experiment, you make your observations and analyze the results, form a conclusion. And it, it looks like the green bugs um, are not just eating the ash trees. They eat other kinds of uh, trees as well. Why are just the ash trees uh, dying then? You know, you, you go through this process, uh, you form a conclusion, and then it leads you to ask a new question. Importantly, importantly, is communicate the results. And next time uh, that we meet on Tuesday, Kara Kugelmeyer, the science librarian, is going to come in and talk about this part right here for you. Uh, what, how science is communicated. Uh, what is a science article? What are the parts of a science article? How do you read a science article effectively? How do you look for a science article that's not some garbage that you just found on the internet? Uh, maybe it's good, but maybe it's not, right? Um, so the communicating the results is, is the essential purpose of the science in some way, right? Because if you're just doing it for yourself, what's the point? You have to clearly, uh, coherently communicate. So uh, these guys with uh, fancy collars here all um, took the scientific method and brought it to Europe. Uh, I'm not going to test you on, on their dates and names and everything. You guys should probably be familiar with their names anyway. Sir Francis Bacon. Bacon, and then Rene Descartes and Galileo Galilei. Uh, the three of them 
really uh, brought the scientific method and made it a, a part of the experience in, in Europe. Um, Rene Descartes said, cogito ergo sum, famously, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. We're going to come back to that. We're actually going to use that at a different point in the semester. So cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, what, do, what do you guys, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Why, why do people bug out about that? Why is that important? Yes? Well, it's not a specific research case, but it, you can relate it to science, but you can also relate it to physics or philosophy, and then that's how you can explain it in your own daily lives. Um, and I just think that you can explain physics a lot. Um, and I believe that was like a philosophy of science concept that they really integrated into the conscious thoughts of the collective beings. Um, and so I think therefore I am, you know, the Okay. So you're you're uh, casting it in this um, people are people but dogs are not people. Exactly. Right, okay. Uh, are there any other thoughts as to what this might mean, why this is important? I mean I think maybe it's kind of like thinking of it as in like how do you know anything? We're actually in here, and it all comes down to that. Like your brain, you're thinking that. So if I'm thinking that, if I'm visualizing everything, therefore it is real. Yeah. How can you prove that I'm sitting here, standing here? Can you prove it? No, but I mean, I see it. I think it. What's the one thing you can prove? The time. Because I think, therefore, I think that you're thinking. It's the it's the objective, it's the objective experience, right? This is the foundation of science, uh, and at the same time, he's ba building the foundation of science, but he's also destroying it in some ways, okay? So that <clears throat> if you take this and follow it. Uh, there, within the uh, philosophy of science, there is um, the idea that uh, what is a fact? What is a fact? How, and, and that our experience of the objective world is based on uh, some sort of assumption that what you're interacting with is meaningful. And what Descartes is saying like, is... Because there was this whole, in, in philosophy at the time, it was like, how do we know things are real? Right, epistemology. Like, how do you know, that, like, the understanding of knowledge. Like, how do you know something is, is, is real? If we just have senses, right? Because there will be people whose senses can be altered, and, they, and there can be two different experiences of the same uh, circumstance, right? And so he's saying, well, the the fundamental objective that we have, the, the, the basic objective observation is of our own mind. That is the only thing that you can, with, without having to go to assumption, it's the one thing that you know is real. It's the one thing that you know that you are able to think, that you exist. Everything else that you experience is based upon the assumption that what you're experiencing is meaningful. That I see you out there, or you see me, or how, whatever, uh, and that it's not a trick of your senses or of, you know, so it's not, we're not living trapped in a hologram like The Matrix or something like that. You know, like, the, the idea of the movie The Matrix is actually based in these kinds of philosophical considerations. So the, the fundamental objective that you have, not subjective, like is, is that phone blue or is it blue-green? I don't know. What do you think? You know, the, the, the thing that you don't have to have appeal to any assumptions for is that you yourself are thinking. And so that becomes important in yoga. That becomes important in yoga and the meditative aspect, the experiential 
uh, aspect of, of yoga. All right, you guys following it? No? Get, let's, let's hammer it out if you want. Cogito ergo sum? Yeah. 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 There's a lot packed in there. Yeah. I mean, it's why it's so famous. It's why it's so famous. And, and he is cited as being uh, the, the beginning of the modern concept of science. All right? Because the philosophy of science, as it's understood in the West, grew out of, out of that statement. He did a lot of other things. Descartes uh, did a lot of other things as well, but that is arguably his greatest contribution, a single sentence. That's powerful. That's powerful, the power of words, ideas. All right. All right, so he said it's this, this process, this process, all right? We get hypothesis. From the hypothesis, we make deductions, and uh, that leads to predictions. Then we make observations in support or rejection of those predictions, uh, which become the testing. And from testing, we go through an inductive process, and uh, which refers back to the hypothesis. Oh my god, what does all that mean? This is getting too sciencey all of a sudden. Let's go through some definitions. Deduction. Uh, it's inferring uh, the uh, a particular instance by reference to a general law or principle. So, for example, all cats have a keen sense of smell. That's a thing. Fluffy is a cat. So, Fluffy has a keen sense of smell. What's the problem with this? Yeah. There might be something abnormal about the Fluffy that makes it have a keen sense of smell. Sure. And, and so what, where is the problem here? Is, is Fluffy a cat? Presumably, yeah. yeah. Huh? What is a cat? Okay, so you're going, you're like, you're going back to Descartes. You're like, whoa, what is a cat? All I know is that I'm me and I'm not a cat. Uh, Fluffy is a cat. So um, what about this? All cats have a keen sense of smell. You'd have to test every single cat that ever was or will be to have that statement be ironclad, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe that initial premise is wrong. Maybe Fluffy is that magical messiah cat that doesn't have a, a keen sense of smell. The, the one, the only. Okay, so on to induction. Um, it's going the other way. It's going to the inference of a general law from a particular instance. All cats that you observe have observed purr. You've seen, how many cats have you seen? I've seen, in my life, probably several hundred at this point. Uh, therefore, every cat must purr. What's the problem here? I mean, it's a little more obvious. You could have like a dog in the same cell. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Maybe it's just cats purr around me and and not anyone else for some reason. I'm special. I, yeah. Oh, I'd like to think I'm special, but it takes more than a cat's purr. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> there's this idea of a scientific paradigm, right? We have some paradigm that we're working in. Like you throw things up and they come down, okay? Um, and that's gravity at work. We have scientific paradigm leads to a deduction. This is the general law, and we're going to make some specific predictions about our little uh, hypothesis that we're going to form with inside of it. So there's the general thing that gravity works. Well, if I pick up my phone and throw it up in the air, presumably it won't levitate and it'll come back down to me, right? So that I'm going, I'm deducing that that's what's going to happen. Let's see if it works. It's really weird if it doesn't. 
Nope, it came down. It came down. All right, so that deduction was useful, right? It worked there. Um, then we make some observations sometimes that come into conflict with a scientific paradigm. What if I picked up this eraser and threw it up in the air and somehow, inexplicably, it started floating, right? These observations conflict with our paradigm. It's they're outside of what is explained by our scientific paradigm, that gravity works and blah, 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 okay? It conflicts with the scientific paradigm. This is a problem. We have a problem. Well, no problem. You just form a new scientific paradigm by induction, by induction. We have, we've made some observations and let's, let's induce a new general principle from it. Okay, you, you're beginning to see that science works. It, there's a lot of good practical outcomes to science, but there are some problems. There are some problems. You can't prove any of this absolutely, right? Because we, we talk about the problems with deduction and induction, right? Careful science needs to be done. Uh, to form the best scientific paradigm possible. All right, so here's an example. So here's our gravity. Scientific paradigm. Force equals mass times acceleration. F equals ma. Sir Isaac Newton. All right? He got hit on the head with an apple. It's great for apples, but this scientific paradigm doesn't really work so well when things get really teeny tiny. The chips in our computers are getting so small that we're getting onto the realm of what's called the quantum level, the atomic level. And there gets to be quantum uncertainties. And in fact, this F equals MA, we start to make observations that are kind of spooky and weird and don't fit into that paradigm. Uh, so Newton fails at small scales, very high speeds like the speed of light strong gravitational fields, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you don't need to know all that. So they came up with a new scientific paradigm. Welcome Albert Einstein and Erwin Schrodinger and his cat. All right, so th th this is how uh, science works. Um, and then I'll say this. So that's, that's the introduction to what science is. I feel like I have satisfied my... Uh, my obligation to uh, the school in terms of the distribution requirement. <laughs> uh, this picture here is, I'm going to go through a little bit of history, some more history, but the history of uh, anatomy and physiology, all right? And, uh, and then we'll bring that together with the yoga. So I want you to understand that sitting here, just sitting here today, uh, listening to me talk about whatever and hoping to learn about the body, you are part of a, a tapestry of learning that goes back for thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years. Right? The yoga, we said, went back 10,000 years. That's a lot. Right? But even just students of the body, uh, this textbook right here, this is a page from a textbook that um, came from ancient Egypt. And they, I don't know, this guy Edwin Smith that found it, got his name stuck on it. It's called the Edwin Smith Papyrus, but he certainly didn't write it. Um, it's an ancient medical text uh, on surgical trauma. So uh, somebody had some sort of a traumatic injury, maybe on the battlefield or something like that and uh, they need it treated, here's a textbook on how to treat it. It goes back uh, to almost 4,000 years ago. That's a long time. That's a long time, folks. Just sitting here, you are the inheritors of, of this. Let's go forward a little bit. I'll, I'll just get a little bit of Greek and Roman stuff in here, and then I'll let you out for lunch. Um, here's Hippocrates. Hippocrates. You guys heard of the Hi Hippocratic Oath? Any of you? Some of you? 
Yeah. Is anyone's parents a physician? Does anyone have a physician for a parent? They certainly had to take the Hippocratic Oath uh, when that when uh, she or he became a physician. And uh, this has been the oath to essentially do no harm. Uh, so that all physicians, going back to Hippocrates, uh, are to do no harm. And this guy, Hippocrates, uh, wanted physicians to seek natural causes of disease uh, rather than attributing them to the acts of gods and demons. Right? And up to this point, the Greeks were like, oh my god, you're sick. Zeus is angry. <laughs> Burn something. Right? Just, like... Take something nice that you have and burn it. That'll make Zeus happy and you'll feel better. Right? And that was not the best way to deal with, you know, the flu or whatever. Um, so this picture on the right here is uh, an example of uh, the Hippocratic Oath from the Byzantine era. So it, it's been used throughout the centuries, this idea of, uh, looking for physical causes for disease, doing no harm uh, to the patients that you serve. Aristotle. Oh, that's it. No, we're done. I'm sorry. It's 1215. I don't want to go over. We'll, we'll pick back up with Aristotle. You thought you escaped Aristotle. You thought you escaped him. I'm not going to make you read a bunch of Aristotle, though. <laughs> You can't escape Aristotle. Just can't. This is a liberal arts college. You're going to get Aristotle left and right. Yeah.